Ta-da. Okay, that works. <clears throat> Hello, ladies. Looks like we're getting settled in. I'm really excited about just being here tonight with all of you and um, excited to hear what God has to say through joy. And um, I don't know, this is just really, it feels so personal, like just special and not to make joy more nervous or anything, but um, I just feel really blessed to be here tonight and to hear her speak. Um, just wanted to go before the Lord in prayer real, um, real fast before we get started. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, um, well, these are your daughters. Um, thank you for bringing them here tonight together. Uh, the opportunity to just uh, see aspects of you uh, through each and every one of them. God, I thank you for that. Uh, I love how you show yourself um, in personalities and, and words that are spoken and smiles, um, glints of the eye. Uh, we appreciate that about you, uh, how you put yourself together before us and the people amongst us. God, I just thank you for what you're gonna say tonight, God, through joy. I thank you for this message. Heavenly Father, help these ladies relax and worship with me as we come before your throne. Amen.
I think the hardest thing about worshiping is uh, is that letting go. Um, this is one of the things I love about worshiping with kids. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen children worship. <laughs> it's like all, they're just all in, body, <laughs> soul, uh, and voice, you know, screeching and carrying on. I screech, but, you know, it doesn't sound cute. <laughs> so um, relax, you guys. I'll let it go. Creating, commanding, trans- 
Okay. Yeah. Well, Diane asked if I would introduce the speaker tonight. Of course, I said yes for a very good reason. A lot of people ask, where did we get the name Joy? Well, it was nothing um, God led or anything like that. A very distant relative that I had as a kid, her name was Joy, and I thought she was pretty special. Then uh, after I was married, I saw the, the movie Brian, uh, Brian's song, Brian Piccolo, and his wife's name was Joy. And that was a special true story, so Joy just stuck. Then we had to find what went with it. So Clarissa went with it just fine, but it put Joy in the middle, and she hated that all the time growing up. Joy was the, her middle name, and she always had to correct her teachers. Everybody's got a story, and everybody has something they've been through in their life. But about 14 years ago in November, there was something that happened that changed our lives forever. And the one thing that I will remember as if it were yesterday, I was 100 miles away with my younger daughter and grandson, and Joy called, and she said, Mom, as she was on her way to the hospital, she said, I don't care what happens, I just want God to be glorified. So here's Joy, my daughter, my friend, and my sister in Christ, my daughter, to tell the rest of the story. Thank you. I don't know if I'm supposed to be crying right now. Starting out, I forgot all about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, I have to read this so I can stay on track. 
But I've been praying over what to share with you tonight. Knowing the theme is the Father's care and fruit of the Spirit. And before I start, I want to read a couple of passages. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you've received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. The fruit of the Spirit is described in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. We receive the fruit of the Spirit as a gift when we receive Jesus into our lives as our Lord and Savior. They are not something we earn or we try to have on our own, but they are a gift. Each believer has them. It's just that we don't always use them. I think of them as like our muscles. If we don't use them and work them out, they're not going to grow or develop. They're just there. I believe God uses trials and different things in life to help develop and grow the spirit, the fruit of the spirit in us. Do you ask God to help you with patience, to use it more? I pray for wisdom to be more of a aware of situations that triggered me to be impatient, like really bad drivers. And I ask for help to use the kindness and the gentleness, especially with those people who are difficult. The best way for me to share how God cares and how he uses things in our lives to develop those fruit within us is to share my story with you, my walk with God. It's quite eventful. But I know that I'm not the same person I was 20 or so years ago, and for that, I'm so grateful. Just real briefly, I was born here in Putnam County. I've lived here all but maybe three years. I was saved around, I think, nine. I grew up in the church. I went to North Putnam and graduated in 92. I was a 10-year 4-H beef member, and I attended four different colleges. There's more to that later. I've lived in three states, Indiana, Wyoming, and Montana. I've gotten to travel to five different countries. I have one son, Austin, who's 18, and I'm married to Scott Rader for almost 16 years this December. My 20s were a time of great trial and growth for me. If you gave a one-year-old a crown and told him to draw a circle or that's pretty much what my life would look like. It would be zigzags and swirls all over. I felt like I was chasing something and seeking God at the same time. I started out as a nursing student in college, dropped out. I was a waitress. I was a flight attendant in training. I was a waitress again and more. Each time I was asking God for direction and doors were either closing or opening. Sometimes I believe God needs to get us away from our surroundings so he can do his work in us. We're all unique, and he works in each of our lives differently. But for me, I had to make a drastic move over a thousand miles from home. I look back now and see how I needed to get away from my comfort zone. I needed new surroundings and was trying to break free from strongholds that I had allowed into my life. God stirred in me the desire to go to Montana, and that's where He began the work in me. Why you say Montana? My sister was at Montana State. My mom had family in Montana. My brother was in Jackson, Wyoming at the time. So, of course, I go to Montana. But that's where God led me. And he began a work in me. It all started in a little country church. I had asked God to forgive me for my sins I had struggled with, and he had. But one Sunday in this church... The pastor was praying at the end of the service. He began to pray for someone who had asked God to forgive them. And he said, I want you to know God's forgiving you, but you need to forgive yourself. Let go of your past, the guilt and the shame, and receive God's grace and forgiveness. I felt like a spotlight was on me. He was speaking to me, and I began to cry. I felt God pour out his love over me, and I felt what 
was like a hot liquid, a warm liquid just being poured over my head. It flowed over my whole body. I was forgiven, but I knew I had to forgive myself as well. And I experienced God's love for me that day in a brand new way. I believe God gave me a desire to go back to school, and so I enrolled at Montana State, and I majored in elementary ed. I was living and working in Montana. I loved everything about it. I felt like my faith was growing. I had new friends, new church, Bible studies. I loved fly fishing with my sister and hiking. I never felt closer to God. I felt like I was finally realizing who I truly was. But be cautious. For our, enemies knows, our enemy knows our weakness and knew my past struggles. And I soon fell back into temptation and into a relationship with someone who did not share my faith. I was still searching for acceptance and love, but not entirely from God. And it caused so much confusion. So much so that I wanted to opt out of my major. My advisor at school sent me to meet with the Dean of Education. He saw my transcripts. Montana State was the fourth college I had been to. And in a very kind but stern way, he told me what my problem was. I had serious commitment issues. It felt like God himself spoke to me. My eyes were open, and I felt a shift in me. I look back on that event and believe that that was one of the most pivotal moments of my life where God revealed to me a problem I had, and it had to get fixed. I see now why. I was more determined than ever to finish college, but my commitment to God was still not 100%. I see now that God was pursuing me. I was in the middle of the fall semester of classes, the first of two semesters of the most strenuous schedule we would have before we started student teaching. I would spend mornings in local elementary schools, then my afternoons were on campus, and my evenings were busy doing projects. In the middle of that semester, another pivotal moment in my life occurred. I know God loves us so much that if we continue to have sin in our life, he'll bring it to our attention. And if we choose to sit on that fence with him, we'll eventually lose our balance and fall. I was trying to live for him, but yet doing what I wanted at the same time. I could not continue to seek after someone else's love when God wanted me to have his love and only his love would satisfy my heart. One day, the turmoil and heartache hit me like a tidal wave. My heart was broken over the sin that I had allowed back into my life. I cried out to God. My heart turned inside out. He saw all of me and still loved me, and I wanted nothing more than to live for him and him alone. I repented. I read in Richard Paul Evans just last night, the best description of repentance, it's a spiritual U-turn, a complete turnaround, and that's what I did. I recommitted my life to God. I fell off that fence that I was straddling, but I landed into his arms. He forgave me, and as I had learned earlier, I needed to forgive myself. From there, I met with my pastor, and asked if I could rededicate my life to God, and he was enthusiastic and said yes. In fact, in a couple weeks, they were gonna be having a baptismal service, and he invited me to come. I felt like a new person, a weight had been lifted. For the next week, I noticed I wasn't feeling well. I was waking up with stomach aches, and I had a horrible time making it to classes. I thought it was the flu. Then some of my classmates had pink eye because we were working in the schools with children. I rem remember waking up Monday morning, a date I will never forget, November 28, 2000, and my eye was pink and itchy. I knew I had better go to the campus clinic and have my eye checked. I felt what I now know was the spirit, moving me to ask the doctor if I could have a pregnancy test. I said it and remember thinking, why did I do that? I knew the moment the doctor came into the room and closed the door what she was going to say. She said, I have no signs of pink eye whatsoever. In fact, the whole time that I had been in the clinic, my eye quit itching and it cleared up. Then she told me I was pregnant. I began to cry. 
I remember her asking me if the father would be supportive, and I shook my head because I did not know. So many thoughts went through my head about school. Where would I live? The future? What would the father say or do? But one thing I felt was God's presence. I had no words, but my heart cried out to him. And as I walked back to my apartment, I felt God right there beside me in the most tangible way. It felt like he was holding my right hand and literally holding me up. Psalm 73, 23 says, I still belong to you, and you hold my right hand. Later that day, my heart would cry out again to him after I told the father. After he asked me what I was going to do about it, he stood up and walked out the door and out of my life. The rejection was painful. But the next Sunday was the day I was supposed to be baptized. And here I was, seven weeks pregnant. I remember being so overwhelmed with joy for what God was doing in me. And even though I had no idea what the future held for me and my little one, I knew he had plans for us. I was baptized in front of many people, including my sister and a few close friends. God blessed me so abundantly with some of the most beautiful godly classmates and friends. I committed that little baby to God, and every day I would thank God for him. I was already in love, first with my father, and now my baby. I finished the semester and began the second semester, the last one before student teaching, except this time I was pregnant and had horrible morning sickness. The father avoided me, but it was never meant to be, and he left for home without telling me. God has a way of bringing people into our lives at just the right moments. I was in a sixth grade math class, and the teacher knew something was wrong with me. I told her I was pregnant. She too became pregnant in college. And because they felt like it was the right thing to do, they got married. They have two boys, but they were not happy. She told me they never should have married simply because she was pregnant. She told me, do not marry him simply because you're having a baby. I took that to heart and asked God to be everything that we would need. I then went to see an esthetician for some facial stuff I was having done. I wasn't able to have it done because I was pregnant. So we sat there and talked for an hour, and what happened in that hour was such a God appointment. She shared with me how she had had an abortion. When she was younger, she was in her 60s at the time, as she was talking to me. She and her sister had taken a train to get the abortion. And other than her sister and husband, I was the only other person she had ever told. I remember the pain in her voice as she told me there's not a day that goes by where she does not think of that child. And she told me, no matter what, do not let anyone talk me into having an abortion. I never thought of having one anyway. But the fact that she shared that painful experience with me solidified my belief to love and cherish this baby. I thank God for placing those two beautiful, courageous women in my life to encourage me. So share your story when you feel God prompting you to. I remember my mom sent me a card during my pregnancy, and she wrote a note. She said she was praying for me and my little peanut and prays that God would show us his love. I still pray for God to show us his love every day, and he's never failed to do so. One month before my baby was born, I received an email from the father's mother. He had told his mom about me finally. Although I had not heard from him in months, she reached out to me. She expressed her desire for this little one to grow, knowing God's love, and to always be surrounded by people who love him. The mother and I began to communicate, and on August 4, 2001, Austin was born. I called the father to tell him and his mom. The father has never been a part of Austin's life, but his family has been. If you hear us talking about our family in South Dakota, this is that family. God blessed Austin with a wonderful family. He even got to know two sets of great-grandparents, and when we were there a couple weeks ago, we got to visit one of the great-grandmothers. She just adores him. He was their first grandchild. And we love them as if they were our own parents and grandparents. I made a choice to let them into our lives, to trust God, and to let him love us through this family, and I'm so thankful I did. The father reached out to me when Austin was 10 to apologize. 
I had not heard from him in years. He regretted the decision he made, and while he had his own struggles, he knew what he did was wrong, but he was happy that Austin had the life and the father he has. I had forgiven him, and whenever God brings this man to my mind, I pray for him. I pray for him to know God. God cares about those who hurt us, so pray for them and forgive. If you're wondering how Austin has handled all this with his biological father, God has truly taken care of him. He's, he has only shared it with a few of his close friends. Austin doesn't talk about it much, but he knows what happened, and we've been very honest with him about it. One day, Austin was at school, and a friend came up to him and said, Austin, do you ever see your real dad? And Austin, in his very blunt and honest way, which he's extremely at times, he said, my dad is my real dad. Another example of God caring for Austin. I finished student teaching, and I graduated from college, finally, in May of 2002. It was a great celebration. <laughs> Talk about commitment issues. I got it done. I'd ask God that if it were his will, if he would bless us with a father and husband who would love us with his love, and that's when Scott came back into my life. We had dated in high school, and Haverhill had several breakups because of me, commitment issues, and had both been through a lot. He met Austin, and they were instant buddies. When Austin was two, we were married, December 6, 2003, right here in this church. Scott was able to adopt Austin as his son one year, after we were married, and so Austin became a raider, and he was Scott's boy. They had they had an unbreakable bond. He was the father and the husband I prayed for, and all along with Scott. Along with Scott, we received another family that had so much love for Austin. And he was again surrounded by love. Austin was four, and we had just moved into the house that we had spent 18 months building. My dad had given us six acres when our lives would be forever changed. Scott's dream was to live on my dad's farm and to walk out his back door to hunt. On November 12, 2005, he got to do that, except he didn't walk back through those doors. He called me around 10 to say he was coming in. Austin and I were cleaning my mom's house as she was bringing my sister and her new baby home. It was around 11.30 when I felt God's gentle voice telling me something's wrong. I looked at the clock, realizing I hadn't heard from Scott which was odd. I began calling him over and over. We would later learn that his phone was right here in his jacket, and every time we called him, he could feel it vi vibrate, but he just couldn't answer it. I called my brother, who knew which tree stand Scott might be in, and he set out to find him. I remember the call from Jesse, my brother, so vividly. The first thing he said was, Scott is still alive. The second thing he said was, he cannot move and needs an ambulance. I remember feeling a rush of fear overwhelm me as I tried to hide it from Austin while calling everyone I knew. Scott had unhooked the safety harness he had just purchased and was climbing down from the tree stand he'd been in a hundred times. He stepped out onto a branch that was wide enough to hold him, but that day it broke. Scott fell at least 20 feet, landing face first onto the ground. He was bent over his knees, unable to move. It truly was a miracle that he survived because of the level of the injury to his spine. He was breathing on his own. He retained consciousness, and he was alert, and he prayed. He prayed for God not to let him die, and God heard him. Scott was airlifted to Methodist, where he would spend the next month and a half 
before being transported to RHI for rehab for another month and a half. While in the hospital, Scott was fighting for his life, but I was going to be fighting a different battle. I remember the doctor giving me the diagnosis. They always, always give you the worst case scenarios. And I expect it, and I heard what he said, and I chose not to hang on to those words as my hope. I chose to place my hope in God that no matter what, he was going to take care of Scott. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. I knew he had a severe life-threatening injury and what the outcomes might be, but my hope was not in this doctor. He was doing his job helping Scott. I had seen God move mountains in my life. I had encountered his love and presence already in so many ways. I recall sitting in the ICU room after Scott's first surgery, and the doctor was running through the diagnosis again and how Scott might be. And when he was done, I said, I know my God is the great physician and that he's in control, and I know Scott is in his hands. I made a bold announcement of my faith. I wasn't backing down. I was shaken, I cried, I was afraid, but the joy of the Lord is our strength, Nehemiah 8.10. God showed us his love through my family, church family, friends, strangers. The outpouring of support was overwhelming. God's hands were upon my family. But even in this, the enemy tried to break me down. The doctor didn't think I was understanding what he was saying, so he had made comments to some when I wasn't around, right before Scott's second surgery. My mom called to tell me that somebody had called her. This first person felt like I was not grasping the severity of Scott's injury and that my mom and dad should have a talk with me. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Some people did not understand where my peace was coming from. I was angry about that phone call, and then I was angry about the doctor questioning my understanding. I confronted this doctor who proceeded to tell me again what Scott won't be able to do. And I was sitting in a chair and I literally felt myself sinking. I just felt like I was just done. But little did I know that thousands of miles away, a family friend was praying for me. And she had just finished and was getting up when she felt God tell her, keep praying for joy. It was that exact moment I was meeting with the doctor. I felt myself then being lifted up. I had no idea this friend was praying for me until later. I was filled with boldness, and I gave that doctor an earful. He apologized, and I only saw him a couple of times when he entered the room to check Scott. He never said a word. I forgive that doctor, and when he does come to my mind, I pray for him too. Stand firm in your faith when the world sees it and calls you a Pollyanna. When you feel like others doubt you, stand firm. We serve a God who is big, and when others see our faith in action, some may think it's weakness or we're in denial or we're, na we're naive, but it's confidence in the one true God who loves us and wants to be glorified in our trying times and all of our times, in the good and bad. And when somebody's laid on your heart, pray. We've been through a lot the last 14 years. And sometimes those years feel more like 24 or 34 or more. The house we built had two stories. And for the first two and a half years after Scott came home, he slept downstairs in a hospital bed until we were able to install an elevator because of generous donations from so many. I gave Scott bed baths for almost three years until a group of churches heard me share our story, so they decided to raise money for us to have a ceiling lift. It picks Scott up from his wheelchair, and it can put him in bed, or it puts him in the tub, and it's such a blessing. Scott has no mobility but a little in his right arm, 
but he can drive his wheelchair, and he can do anything on a computer using voice-activated software. He went back to work part-time in 2007, about a year and a half after he came home. He works for the bank he worked for, and right now he's praying for a full-time opportunity. He wants to be off a disability. So if you ever think of him, pray for him for that, because he wants to work more. Scott did not quit being a father because his body doesn't work. In fact, he helped coach Austin's baseball teams. Six of those years were travel ball, where we spent most of our summers driving the games. Every weekend, he got to share his love of baseball with a whole generation, including his son, who he taught how to throw, hit, and pitch, all from his wheelchair. And traveling was not easy. In fact, I hated it. <laughs> Staying in hotels was hard. Scott couldn't always get into the dugouts or the restaurants or other buildings, or worse. On very hot days, he can overheat, and he does not sweat like we do. And so everything gets dumped into his bladder, and the only way to fix it is for me to cap him, which is me relieving the bladder, and it could happen at any time on those hot days. His blood pressure can also spike, which can be life-threatening for him if we don't relieve him quickly. He's taught Austin all things about hunting. There were several mornings when the two of them would head out in the cold, Scott would be all bundled up, and Aust by his side, and they would walk to one of the hunting blinds that was built so they could get in it. Scott has a track chair that my parents bought him. It's got those big, like, bulldozer tracks. It's been all over the farm, everywhere. And one winter, when it snowed so much, we had to call my dad to come get us because it ran out of batteries, because we were going for a walk. And that was fun. But God cares about every detail of our lives, even our hobbies. Since Austin was four, his dad has been in a wheelchair, so he has had a different perspective on things than I think most kids his age. When I think back to the prayer I prayed, asking God for a father for Austin, and a husband would love us with God's love. I see how God had a perfect plan all along. In fact, they have the same eye God. Life is challenging for us. I have moments where I feel so weak and tired. I get impatient, I cry. I wish things were different at times. This is hard. God does allow more in our life than we can handle. Because if he didn't, I would need God. I know Scott has moments too. It's very hard for him. But I know God's blessed him with strength. And he will tell you that I give him lectures. I call them pep talks. <laughs> Depends on the day. As his caregiver, I sometimes forget to see him as my husband, but he is my best friend. I cannot imagine life without him. Our marriage does look very different than most couples, from most couples. And because I do most everything for Scott, I sometimes try to do everything for Scott. And trust me, he lets me know he doesn't need me to do everything for Scott. He's very honest, and I think that's where Austin got it from. There are times when I'm not so patient, when he asks me for what seems like the hundredth time to work up, warm up his neck thing, which is a neck, little pad. He has neck pain, and we're always warming it up in the microwave. My mom and my mother-in-law can attest to that, but he's always in pain. And we do that all day long. I sigh, and I realize I need to be more patient. But God made us uniquely different, yet we complement each other. He is the one who handles all the hard stuff, the bills, the phone calls. He worked in the bank for years dealing with people, so he has much better phone etiquette than I do. I get emotional. I take things personal, and Scott, Scott will tell me to let it go and don't worry about it. A day in our life... The first thing I do every morning is I cath Scott, which is I relieve his bladder. 
using a catheter every morning. That's the only way he can go to the bathroom. I have my quiet time. It can be 5 or 15 minutes, but I need it. I get Scott dressed. I'm not a morning person, so I have put his shirts or his pants on him backwards and inside out. I put his shoes on the wrong feet. I put his glasses on him upside down one time, and he looked at me like, Joy, really? <laughs> I put his deodorant on. I check his skin for bed sores, which he's only had one major one and a very tiny one in the last 14 years, which is a thank you, God, because those are very, very easy for people like Scott to get. Then I use our ceiling lift to put him in the chair, his chair. I brush his teeth. He didn't want me to share this with you, but one time I was um, out of regular toothpaste, and I have a drawer where I throw all the little samples from the dentist in, and... Um, <laughs> My mom knows what I'm going to say. Um, so I reach down, and I'm so tired. I grab a tube, and I put it on his toothbrush, and I'm brushing his teeth, and he goes, what is that? And I go, it's toothpaste. What else would it be? And I'm brushing his teeth. I went in, finished getting dressed. I go back in there. I had just put Preparation H on his <laughs> toothbrush. I didn't tell him for a few days. And, um, and that occasionally now, if I change toothpaste, he'll, he'll, is this toothpaste joy? I'm like, yes. <laughs> and then he asked me to tell you do not come to, up to him at church and ask him about the preparation age story. So he said, okay, you can tell it, but just tell them the little disclaimer. I shave him. I wash his face. Every two to three days, he gets a bath, which he hates. I clean his nose out because he can't blow it and he can't wipe it. We started praying every morning together several years ago. And when we're done praying, I send him down the elevator. I get him set up on his computer. I feed him breakfast, give him his medicine, which he takes every six hours. Then he either works from home or I take him to the office. I stay busy at home. Every other day, he has to have a bowel movement. And I have to help him with that because he cannot go on his own. We both hate it. In fact, it's the reason I dropped out of nursing school, that and giving shots in the side of blood. But when you do it for someone you love, it's different. I have to cath him, like I, I told you earlier, which is draining his bladder. I have to do that every four to six hours, so I cannot be away from him more than that. Some people have a bag catheter or Foley catheter, and he has had one of those on occasions when he's had kidney stones or surgeries, but his doctor doesn't want him on that because he's young and he's healthy. I have tried part-time work. I have people ask me all the time, do you work? I say, yes, I take care of my husband. It's hard to make a set schedule with work and make it work in our unpredictable one because every week for us isn't always the same. Caring for Scott is like a full-time job, and I'm on call 24-7. But my outlet is walking. I walk almost every day, even in the cold temps like we had this morning. And I always say that's why God made car hearts. So our Father cares about our health. In conclusion, we live in a world where God is not the only one at work. We have an enemy. And the Bible tells us in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Well, I believe God allows things to happen. We have a choice in how we're going to respond to those things when they do happen. I believe we are tested. Our faith is tried. And that is how it grows. That's how the fruits of the Spirit grow, through trials and hard things in life. And that is when others see Christ in us. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Joy is one of the fruits of this one of the fruit of the Spirit. It's a gladness in every situation, an awareness that our present circumstance is temporary and that our life is in Christ. 
He is the source of our joy. We can choose two ways, God's path or our own path, which leads us in the opposite direction into pain, confusion, heartache, and more. There is no gray area with God. Every time you're faced with a trial or temptation or any decision, how do you choose the way you'll go? Do you allow things to make you bitter or better? God loves us so much, he only wants our best, no matter how hard it is to understand his ways and why things happen. He cares about every detail of our lives. I cannot imagine life without him. It's a scary thought. His plans for us are far greater than we can have for ourselves. He does not limit our freedom, but he gives us the freedom to live. Let him work in your life and see his goodness and love through every circumstance, whether big or small. And my favorite verse is Romans 8, 28. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And that is the truth. such a powerful message. We really appreciate your sharing, Joy. I know that that had to have been difficult to go through some of those things and kind of relive the moment, if you will, but we all have trials. And as she said, you know, joy is a choice. You know, what do you choose? Do you choose to go your own direction and, and end up with a painful journey, or do you choose God's direction and live with joy despite the circumstances? Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for this evening and for the message and pray that each woman here will take to heart what has been spoken and that we'll never forget that it is not the circumstance, but it is you that we want to run to. And we want to make sure that we're following you and not going our own direction and living with that pain. But, Father, that you will take everything and write your story. We ask that each woman that is here tonight, if she does not know you, that she will ask, seek, and that you will certainly, as Joy mentioned, run after her. Father, we just thank you. Be with each lady as she travels home. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.